Uh, the idea, I guess it was two weeks ago, uh, our campus announced that we were going to be sending all the students home and our athletics were canceled for the season. And on Friday the 13th, the morning of Friday the 13th, I canceled 105 photo shoots between now and uh, mid-June. So I know that all of us have kind of gone through that similar experience and just how uh, devastating that is to, to, to have all these things that we were looking forward to doing to be gone. So I, I think it took a couple days for me to kind of process that. I, I think I was definitely went through a funk. And uh, I, think on, I think it was Monday or Tuesday before I kind of you know, shook myself and said, you know what, it is what it is. I can't control it, but I can control how I react to it. So I'd much rather be an optimist. Again, it's always better to be an optimist and always be wrong than to be a pessimist and always be right, right? So the way I look at this is, is this is an opportunity. You know, any, anybody, any challenge that you have is an opportunity for growth. So why not make it, take advantage of this time where we have things have slowed down to maybe look at our processes, look at what we're doing. And of course, digital asset management was one of the first things that I thought of, you know, if we could spend some time focusing on improving our processes and improving our organization, uh, we'll come back even stronger from this. So we've all been given a lot of lemons, so it's time to make some lemonade. So thanks for joining us. I'm glad that you guys are here. I just wish I had something more exciting to talk about. Maybe next week, we'll see. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So we're gonna call this the basics of digital asset management. So digital asset management, the best and the most descriptive acronym that accurately describes what digital asset management is. And I do get asked that all the time, like how do you, what's the definition of digital asset management? To me, it's everything that happens to your photos and videos from the point of creation till 100 years from now. And that's a lot of, obviously that's a lot of stuff, but it really comes down to, you know, the fact that as a photographer, you're in charge of your photos. Nobody is going to care as much as you do. Nobody's going to put as much effort into preserving those photos as you will. It everything comes down to you. And in fact, if a client ever loses the photos that they have, who are they going to come to? You. So as photographers, as creators, we're in charge of that history. And that's a, and that's a, and that's a, that's a lot to, to manage, but again, that's, that's what we do. So and I love the, I love the tagline, you know, the visual history of higher education. I think that uh, we should probably approach our photos as like we're historians. We're documenting the history of campus. And when you approach your job as a historian, you, you treat those photos in a different way. You, you respect them even more. And you, need, and you do whatever it takes, whatever you need to do to preserve that history. And that's what we're all about. So, uh, First of all, you definitely should look check out this book. It's called The Damn Book 3.0 by Peter Crow. I haven't found anything better, a better resource for digital asset management. It's a lot, there's a lot there, but anything, any question you have, he's got a great answer for. And he's, he's definitely the, the expert when it comes to digital asset management, photography, and, and also video. So uh, here's the website you can get the book at, thedambook.com. Also, there's a paperback edition and a PDF edition. Honestly, the PDF edition is just fine. Throw it on your iPad, it's really easy to keep it with you. So, and I, I do need to say this before I jump it too much further. You do you. Um, I'm gonna share what we do and what we, why we do it, but that's not necessarily the best way. Each photographer has, has their own set of challenges, their own set of requirements that they, they need to do adapt any information that you have to yourself. Uh, and you know, you may start at one place, you may end up somewhere else, but that's okay. I sometimes feel like I get passionate about what I believe and I say that this is the way to do it, but just remember, I don't know that much. So just you do you. So everything comes down to this. Basically, we need to be organized, accessible, and archived. So we'll start off with organized. How do you describe organized? And I think that the best way to describe it is Let's just assume that you were hit by a bus today. Would your colleagues at work be able to find the photos tomorrow? That's kind of what, that's how I describe being organized. The system can't all be in your head. 
you can't be the only person that knows where everything's at or how to find things. Being organized means that you're replaceable. So you need to have a written out plan for how you're gonna ingest, rename, caption, organize, and archive your photos and your videos. That's really important. Again, you, if, they're gonna out, if, if these, this data is gonna outlast you, you need to have a plan for it and actually to outlast you. And I know that sounds really morbid, but it's, it's a really good thing to be working on right now. Uh, it used to be really easy, going back to 1999, back when I, Mark uh, Philbrick hired me in, in 1998, actually. And I was a darkroom tech at first, and digital asset, asset management was a cake walk. All we had to do is take the slides, put a sticker on them, and put them in a drawer. You know, at most we had a, we, we had an Excel uh, document with everything on it, but if I went back to the drawer the next day, the file would be there. It was easy. And then came along this, this little camera. And I see you, a lot of you guys remember the good old days of the Nikon D1. The, the most magenta camera ever made, as, as we like to call it. Um, we got this camera in 2001 and it was funny because uh, very quickly, we realized that this was a completely different ball game. We didn't really know how to deal with these digital files. We didn't know how to integrate them into our existing system. So we did some kind of dumb things. One of the biggest things that we did uh, that was probably a mistake at the beginning is, is we, we tried to keep all the original file names from the camera. We kind of felt like, well, this is the negative, so we should keep everything and not change anything, not rename anything. And of course, you guys know that's a mistake because a few months later, clients would come asking for DSC 1228 and we'd have 500 versions, right? So, so that's kind of when we realized we really need to, we need to become experts at this and, and, and have a solution that's gonna last us for a much longer time. Um, I can't recommend highly enough Photo Mechanic. I know most of us use Photo Mechanic, but maybe there are some out there that don't. Um, some crazy people that maybe even use Bridge. It's time to stop, it's time to join, join the rest of us. Photo Mechanic is where it's at. It's, the, it's gonna be the quickest way to manage and organize your photos. Uh, Photo Mechanic 6, camerabits.com. Again, a single license for 139. There's discounts for both bulk and EDU licenses. Worth every penny. And I, I can't only say that about Photoshop, but, but, but Photo Mechanic, absolutely. Um, it's, the, it's the primary thing we do to organize our photos, rename our photos, call, we'll, we'll go into that here in a second. Okay. Okay, so the process uh, for organizing, this is basically how we would do, um, how, how we're gonna organize our photos. We'll take pictures, I guess that's the first part. You always need to take some pictures. And then we'll do a download, which is called ingest. And what I'm doing is I'm generally downloading it to an external drive attached to my iMac. And of course that takes time. So at, while I'm doing the ingest, I'm also going to our, our shoot log, which is just a database. It's just an Excel document where we go ahead and we record all of our photo shoots. Um, we, as you can see here on the shoot log, the date, the file number is, it's just an ascending file number. So if I enter the next one, it's going to be 2002-38. A quick description, which you could call the slug, the photographer, any assistance, total number of frames, total number of hours. And if you go over further, it actually will, will actually have a, a slip to record evening, nights, weekends, traveling, all those kind of things. We track all that information. I actually uh, was working on a blog post about the shoot log and maybe I'll do a future, um, a future webcast with, about it because it's, it, I think it's a really helpful and a useful tool, but I'm just gonna just, I'm just gonna give a little tease for it right now. So again, I'm, I'm gonna, while that, those files are downloaded to my computer, I go ahead and I, and I find out, okay, this, here's my file number, what it needs to be. This is the way our file numbers look uh, for a jet. We have two types of photo shoots. We have sports and we have general. Sports are, are com completely different and we do a different system, I'll show that. But for our general photo shoots, here's, here's the system. Every file number starts with the year. The first two digits again are gonna be the year. The second two digits are gonna be the month the file was captured in. And then the assignment number is basically that, again, that ascending number. So we know that this is the 14th photo shoot of, uh, of the month. And then of course, frame number, we should be pretty simple. Now for sports, uh, again, we have a little bit of a different system because it's, it's in a completely different archive. We're gonna start with the season. Then we always have a three letter designation for each sport. Uh, it's gonna be at or versus, you know, whether it's a home or away, and then the opponent. And then again, the file name at the frame number as, as usual. And that's just generally how we name all of our files. 
Now, if there's a series, for example, baseball, you know, you play three or four games in a row, rather than lump all, them all together, we've decided to separate them into individual days. So that, that 321 is March 21st, the, the game that happened on that day. We've kind of gone back and forth trying to figure out what's the best thing to do that. Right now, it's where we're at. Um, it just makes the most sense. The same thing with like a football practice where I'll have a spring ball, you know, on the 21st and the 23rd and the 28th. I do make a separate photo shoot for each one of those. So anyway, the great thing about Photo Mechanic, it's really easy to rename. It's really fast to rename. And uh, I definitely, definitely recommend that. Next comes the caption. Um, so I'm gonna see if I can move this window a little bit. Oh, there you go, sorry. The window was blocking what I could see. Um, the caption, uh, really the caption, the best thing to do is make sure that you're covering the who, the what, the where, the when. You know, the old, the old uh, days of writing a caption in, in the, for the newspaper, they, they still apply. Oh, let me fix that. First of all, the who, who's in the photo. I also will add contact information if it's appropriate. For example, if I'm taking a picture of a student on campus and I need to have, you know, get permission for something, I have their email or the phone number. Um, we try to get as much information that, that's needed. Next, the what, what's happening, what's, why is it irrelevant, what's the story? You know, you should make sure that you're at least giving, you have to remember that most people that are looking at your photos weren't there. You have to make sure you're communicating uh, fully what's going on and why it's important. The where should be pretty uh, self-explanatory, but we also, we always put location, the building, the college, the department, city, state, country, uh, because that's all metadata that can be searched later. So for example, we have an engineering building that's brand new. Any, any photo shoot we do in that engineering building, we tag that building because the engineering, engineering department will just type in engineering building in their, in their keyword search and everything will come up, which is what they actually really want. They love that. Or the same with a sub department or a department or a college. And then finally, the when, it's really important to capture the, the capture date and time, you need to make sure that you have that. So here's, here's the metadata in Photo Mechanic. This is an example of a, just a, a standard caption that we have. Um, I, look at, I look at the, the metadata and, and the caption basically is like a dog tag. This is a dog tag we created for our youth of our, of our church. And a dog, the whole purpose of a dog tag is that you can find out who it belongs to, right? So your, your caption is so important that, that it, it basically, no matter what happens, if that photo gets renamed, if it, somebody finds it, they can find out who created it, they can find out who they need to talk to, they can find out the basic information of it. Here's our metadata template. It's pretty simple, pr pretty similar to what most of you are doing. Uh, an example of a caption from this photo we just looked at. There's not, I mean, it's not a lot of information, but it's the important information, the information that I need to have. Um, next comes keywording. Again, keywords can be anything, but we've, we've used keywords that are from a predetermined set of terms. We have, you know, two staff photographers and we have six student photographers. If we were all just coming up with our own keywords, they would never match up and it would be, it would be chaotic. So I, uh, I got some help from Ken Bennett over at Wake Forest. He, uh, he got me, he gave me his structured keyword panel, taught me how to use it. And uh, we've been doing that for the last couple of years and it's been great. It's been a big thing. And in fact, I, I'm not going to go too deep into it because Ken actually agreed to do a webcast on his structured keyword uh, panel, so basically how you do use structured keywords, how to set one up for yourself. So I appreciate he's willing to do that. And I think, again, that's something to be really used for, for most people in the group. So again, here's our structured keyword panel. Again, you can type in up the top, you can type in, oh, I wanna search for lab and it will give you all the different options. And then you can just double click on things and it will add it, add all those keywords. And those are, again, these are the, the standardized keywords that we use at the university. They're, they're the ones that people are gonna search the most. So here's the example of the keyword, you know, academic, college or family, home and social sciences, FHSS, which is the, their acronym, Kennedy Center for International Studies, China Teachers. So all of those keywords are gonna be added to the photos also. Just again, we, you, you want in the, day, in, the, in the age of big data, you want rich descriptive information that will help tell the story. Uh, now, when you add these batch keywords, we're generally adding them to everything, but then we're gonna go back and add specific keywords to certain photos. For example, let's say you have 100 photos and in 10 photos is one student. You don't want that, that, that name to be in all 100 photos because it, it doesn't make any sense. Make sure that you're, you're applying the correct, the correct caption, the correct keywords, the correct metadata to the right photos. 
it takes a little bit more time, but again, that will save you in the long run. It'll make things a lot easier. Uh, next comes the edit phase. I'm not gonna tell you how to edit. You know how to edit, but the way we do things or the way we save things is, is we, we have a raw folder where we keep all the, of the keepers and uh, we, have a, we have a folder of just edits, JPEGs, TIFFs, whatever. And it's really organized simply. So example, for an example, here's what it looks like in our uh, folder structure. You know, all the raw are in one folder, all the edits are in another folder. It, we all do use this exact same system. It makes it nice and clean. Uh, the next, of course, is you're gonna have to save. Save your photos somewhere. Um, make sure that your plan is written down and again, and ensure that all of your photographers are properly trained. They're following the plan. Uh, it, it, if one person doesn't, isn't on board, it's gonna make a chaotic mess. Again, the opposite of organization is chaos. So we're gonna take a few questions. Nate, you uh, got any questions for me? Um, so far, they've been pretty, uh, pretty good to answer. I don't know if we have, people can start chiming in with other ones while I'm responding, but uh, I guess some of the questions were, these slides gonna be online? Um, screenshots, are they from Photo Mechanic? How many keywords? are in our actual uh, keyword list, stuff like that. Uh, we are recording this presentation. It'll be online. I can also share just the slides if you'd like. I'm happy to do that. I'll put a, uh, something on the Facebook page. Uh, keywords, I don't know. There's a lot of keywords. What would you say, Nate? Well, I was, so our, our structured keyword list is kind of interesting because we have a section that's called just keywords. And in there, I, I was responding to Tim on the, on the chat. I think, I don't know if I were to guess, there's probably a hundred. Right now we're going through and kind of updating that. Um, so our students have stuff to do from home and that we have stuff to do from home. We're, we're kind of working on our keyword list. Um, so maybe about a hundred different words. I mean, you're looking at words like microscope or female or male student, you know, different things like that. Uh, but then you add, you add the different departments, the different sports, um, all the all the other stuff like that. So there would be well more than a hundred if you add all of all of the rest of it. Uh, the different buildings, uh, there's probably a hundred just in that alone. Yeah, and I would I would just say, like I said, we're going to let Ken uh, cover the keywords. That's his he's expert in this, and uh, I'm, like I say, it'll be a great presentation for him to share. I'll just I'll just vouch for the structured keyword system. It's, it's saved us because we, we did not have a very good organized system for keywording. Uh, it's completely changed how we do things and, I, and it, the photographers love it because they don't have to come up and come up with a bunch of, sit down and come up with a bunch of keywords. It's all kind of listed out. What we're telling our, our students is basically like, you wanna make sure that in 100 years, somebody's gonna be able to find what they're looking for. Uh, and that's it. And even right now, while, we're work, uh, while we have a bunch of our students home working, they're not here in the office, they're actually going through our stock gallery and they're updating and adding additional keywords that are more specific to each of the photos. Uh, that's that's going to be something that's going to be really helpful for us in the future. So uh, any other questions? Yeah, we got quite a few. So, uh, oh man, there's a, there's a few to go through. One here, here's a good one with uh, our renaming strategies. So when we have multiple photographers, how, how to kind of explain how we, uh, do that process in there to, to keep the uh, multiple photographers, multiple cameras, how we keep the, the renaming. Oh, I'll tell you, that, that's, that's a problem, of course, right? Um, for example, a football game, me and Nate will be shooting and then we'll have maybe three or four student photographers. So basically for any, we call them combo shoots where you have multiple photographers. Somebody will be in charge of the shoot. So for example, on a football game, I'll be in charge and I have a hard drive that everybody's gonna be, or over the server, they're gonna give me all their photos and they're going to be, they're going to go ahead and rename their photos, you know, their, their, um, for example, their name, you know, uh, Nate, and then they're going to do it in chronological order, separated by pregame, postgame, all that kind of stuff. And then that one photographer that's in charge is going to kind of combine everything together and make it work. Uh, football is obviously chaotic because, you know, you're going to have 10,000 or more photos. Uh, most, most assignments where we have two photographers, you know, there'll be a full-time staff member and then a student, the student will just, you know, share with us their photos on the server, we'll add them to the end of the shoot. Um, we'll make sure that we rename it and it follows you know, the same system. 
sometimes we'll rename and put all the photos in chronologically. And sometimes we'll just do photographer one, photographer two, photographer three. It just kind of depends on, the, on, on what it is and the assignment. Um, but photo mechanic will, makes it a lot easier to, to manage that and to deal with that. All right, Jaren, here's another one from Jason. Um, have, have we ever done a major keyword template change? And how do you reference images in the old keyword system? Uh, we, we actually are doing one right now. We're updating our keywords. We haven't changed in a year or so. Um, so it's something we try to do in the spring or the summer. Um, we, won't, we probably won't go back and change things. More often than not, we're just making additions. Uh, the, the, the one issue that we do have is, for example, they change the name of our business school. So we really need to rethink and probably go back to some of the older shoots and update those keywords with the new business na school name. So that's, that's uh, one of those summer projects, you know, that you can do, or if there happens to be a virus taking over the world, maybe that's something you can do at this time. It's a really good time to do it. Uh, getting, getting caught up to date, that's just gotta be a, like say every year you've got a plan for that type of a project. Another one from Glenn uh, asking if we share our data asset management outside the photo department. Uh, as far as, I, I, what's the scope though? Like the photos or? Yeah, you want to respond, Glenn? What are your, uh, what are your questions? Oh, I can unmute myself. Look at that, Jaron. Yeah, so, I'm if, thinking is, so if you've got the a good keyword list and someone this is another department search your your damn system to look for photos so do they have access to that keyword list so they can type in words to search for oh that's a that's a really good question we haven't and it's something we actually are planning on doing um on our on our website where people who are stock galleries are listed we actually do track every search uh, and we use, you know, Google Analytics to look at the search, the top searches. That helps us a lot also to, to kind of pay attention to what keywords people are using. Sometimes we've actually added keywords that we didn't think were important, but when 100 people search for the same term, you know you need to have it in your system. Uh, with people that use our photos a lot, you know, graphic designers, the magazine, that is a good idea for us to go ahead and share that keyword list with them so they know what we're speaking the same language. Um, I, I wish it was easier because uh, again, sometimes these keyword lists look like a lot, they're overwhelming, but that's probably something we could actually meet with those individual departments and train them how to do it. That's a good idea. Have, have you ever considered working with librarians to come up with keywords that are a little more universally known? Um, we, we, you know, we've done a little bit of adjustments. That's something we could do. We haven't done yet. Again, I'm using I'm using the user data mostly to to determine what it is. Uh, I think those of you that were at symposium in Washington a couple of years ago, uh, when Peter Crow came and spoke to us, he did mention uh, what he mentioned was is that fact that when people are searching for for photos, they're using usually one word, simple. You know, they'll type in students or they'll type in the building name. And in our data, when we look at this website, that's exactly what we're seeing. So we, we, we try to make sure that the most important things are there, which is, you know, the proper names, the locations, you know, and those are almost 90% of what people search with. So I think we're probably using more user generated uh, suggestions than anything else. Hey, Aaron, uh, quick question. Sorry, I was, I'm on two Zoom meetings right now. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, so Gabe just asked on a text message, um, and you might have just covered this. I probably caught the tail end, but talking about Google Analytics to know what keywords people are using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We it's it's very it's pretty easy to set up. Again, we're using Libris, so uh, it's very easy to set up the Google Google Analytics on that and go and check that data from time to time. Uh, I think it's a very helpful thing. You want to know what people are searching for and what words they're using because it may not be lined up with the words you would, would use. So do whatever you can do to get that type of feedback. Oh yeah, it looks like uh, Lucas just said the same thing. Um, another thing Ken was asking, let me go back up there, walking through our archive really quick um, from the user's point of view. So kind of share your screen and show how our archive is set up uh, we're actually going to get into that right here in just a minute should I just go ahead 
Yeah, and then before you do that, if you have, well, if you have Photo Mechanic 2, um, just showing quickly how to pull the keywording structure out of Photo Mechanic, how to export that into a shareable document. Um, I, I, I'm going to let Ken do that when he when he jumps into uh, structured keywording. He, he, he'll go over all that stuff uh, next week. And I, uh, I'm not sure when next week, but I think he was planning on next week sometime to do that. Okay, well, we'll jump into accessible then. So the way I describe accessible is making sure that people have access to your photos. You know, it's a shame if you take these great photos and then they just sit on a shelf and they never get used. So making them accessible is making sure that they get out to the people that need them. That's your clients, that's your coworkers, that's whoever needs access to those photos. Uh, there's a few ways to do it, of course. Uh, first of all, local server. It could be a simple file server or, or a NAS, which is net network attached storage. You control who has access to the specific files or folders, and they can be only accessed through the local network or remotely, depending on your setup. Now, you can store and distribute uh, the files locally, but your ability to widely share your images will be limited by your hardware. Uh, most of us have a server. Again, maybe only your office can access them or just your college or your apartment can access them. Uh, it definitely gets harder to host the web page by yourself when you're dealing with lots of photos. The next level would be cloud storage. Now, uh, there's lots of cloud storage sites. We're going to be becoming really familiar with them. Google Drive, OneDrive, Box, Dropbox, stuff like that. Basically, I, the way I like to explain it is this, is that these cloud storage sites are kind of like your warehouse. You know, that's where you store all the goods, uh, but you would never want to take your client into there and have them look through your warehouse. Um, for example, we, we have a, we use box.com, which is great, but the user interface is horrific. And for clients to look through and choose photos off of it, it's just too slow, too clunky. It is not a good solution for that type of thing. So we would go through the next level. So again, there's your warehouse. But the next level would be a cloud, a cloud distribution site. And that's again, a website, a web-based library that's optimized for clients to search and access your files. Examples, Photo Shelter, Libris, Asset Bank, Flickr, SmugMug, sites like that. In using the same analogy versus your warehouse, these cloud distribution sites are more like your storefront. You know, that's the counter where people go look at the, the most important things and they can make their choices and make their purchases. It's, it's gonna be, it's all about optimization for the client to come and browse through your goods. So I'd much rather go here and find my chocolate than in the warehouse, right? Uh, here is our site, which is byphoto.com. Um, this is an example of what our stock gallery looks like. Uh, this is, uh, I, th I think, yeah, let me, let me explain that. Basically, Libris, for example, we don't have every single file on Libris. That's not what it's for. We have our edited JPEGs that we want to share on Libris, so the selects, and especially our stock gallery. We've, uh, a couple of years ago, we started building a very large stock gallery, and it's something that's really important to us. The reason is, is we, we give free download access to every BYU employee and BYU student. They can use these photos for their projects. As long as they're non-commercial, as long as they're not making, trying to make money off of the images, they can use them. The reason for that is, is that we want, it's my job to make sure that we're managing the visual brand of BYU. I had far rather they use a great picture that Nate Edwards took than some photo off of iStockUp.com. And the only way that you're going to get them to use those great photos is, is make it as easy and as simple as possible for them to download high quality imagery versus going to iStock and buying, it, buying a cheap photo. So that's, that's a really important part of our strategy. We don't charge for any of that. It's what, what we consider to be our service to the university, but it's what helps maintain that visual brand. Professors, students all over campus, when they're doing their presentations, when they're making the brochures, they're generally using our photos because we're giving them 10,000 options and we're constantly updating them and we're trying to make sure that the campus community has the things that they need. We actually go to the campus communicators and ask them, hey, is there any hole? Is there anything that you need? Oh, you need some lab photos from this college? We'll go take some pictures of those. Um, this is, again, going forward, this has become a very important part of what do we do. And for example, right now where campus is pretty much shut down, they still have access to this and uh, they're still using it quite a bit. Um, and this is just kind of explaining, you know, what I just said. So our, our website, basically our Libris website, houses our files, our, our files for our clients, but it also houses our stock gallery. 
So it's basically two separate sides of that. Uh, what questions do you have about this section? Uh, Nate might be in the other meeting. No, I'm, I'm here. Um, so Glenn asks if this can work for video, and then what if a student downloads one of our images for use on their social media platforms, and then do students or employees need to request downloads? Uh, students and employees with the, it's the great thing is is you have the same sign on that they use for login they use for every university service you can log into our Libra site that's something you can set up with with photo shelter um, they on these stock images they don't have to ask permission they're there they're usable now I do need to make one step one clarification athletics images are not a part of that stock gallery any photo that has an NCAA athlete in it are pulled off and again there are many NCAA regulations and if I just gave free access to those photos you know that I'd have a lot of uh, compliance issues. So anything that has current athletes, we, we don't have as part of our stock gallery and those you do need to ask and, and we actually have to go through the compliance process with our compliance department to make sure that they're being used correctly for things that are allowed by the NCAA. But no, there's lots and lots of pictures there that people can use. What was the other question? Uh, asking about what if a student downloads one of your images to use on their social media platform? Then they do it. It's okay. So it's helping to be all your brand, you know, and it's, uh, I'd love for them to give me credit every time, but they won't. And I, again, it's all about the brand. It's all about high quality, quality representation of BYU being used. And then Glenn had asked about, what was Glenn's question? Uh, if this works for video and then also, um, can you clarify the Libris photo shelter relationship? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Libris can host video. We don't really, we have a little bit. Nate does a lot of drone video of our campus and we have some, I don't know if it's available on Libris yet, but you can put it there. Uh, that is something that, that Libris is trying to do. Uh, Photo Shelter and Libris are the same company. Photo Shelter uh, it was, came first and then came Libris. Photo Shelter is really uh, more the single user uh, interface and Libris is more the, the multi-user interface. Photo Shelter is a lot cheaper. Libris is a lot more expensive. You have a lot more control over giving individual people different access levels. Um, and it's something that we've been really happy with. Uh, we've been using them for a couple of years now. Um, so question about model releases for images of our students. Uh, model releases, it, it, it depends on your campus. You know, we're a private institution, so we're a little bit, we're lucky because when people walk onto BYU's campus, it's private property. Technically, we don't need model releases. Now, we generally will get at least verbal permission from people when we're taking their pictures, but if I'm shooting a wide shot of 100 people, I'm not worried about it. Uh, now, when we're doing uh, photo shoots that are specifically meant for commercial purposes, we're doing an ad through the bookstore or something like that, yeah, we'll get model releases, and they're just a very basic release, uh, nothing fancy. In fact, with something we're working with, I'm trying to get our legal department to give us a little bit more customized one for just our office. Uh, but that doesn't mean that works on UBU's campus. They're a public institution. It's very different. So we're we're probably not the ones to ask about model releases because, like I said, we're we don't have we don't have the same restrictions that other campuses have. Another question: How do you manage the warehouse, or I assume the server, when you have multiple photographers? Very carefully. Uh, you know, it's basically, I think it's important that somebody is designated as the archivist. You know, they're in charge of making sure that it stays organized and it's done. In our office, it's Nate. He manages and makes sure that, the, that things are correctly filed and that things are backed up. He'll often use students, uh, some of our, our student employees, to help him do that. And again, that's something we do a lot of our cleaning up um, in, in the summertime when we try to make sure that everything's correctly filed. But when you have multiple photographers, you have, you have many potential problems. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that we use the shoot logs to make sure that we're not overlapping our file numbers. It, it, the, the shoot log is basically a shared Google Doc that we can hop onto. And then if I know that my shoot is 83, the next photographer to hop on there knows their shoot is 84. That's been the, probably the best thing to help us make sure that we are communicating well and then we're not overlapping or overstepping each other. All right, another question. How would you suggest setting up a stock gallery from nothing? I'd start with one photo, then I'd get another photo and, you know, go from there. I don't know. Um, I'd say, I'd say you need to sit down and come up with a list of what are the most 
important and used photos. What are the photos that people request the most from your office? Uh, I think when I started my first stock gallery, it was like 12 or 13 years ago. And I said, okay, I need a couple great scenics of campus that people can use. I need an overall of the football stadium. I need an overall of the basketball arena. And I started from there and it just kind of grew little by little by little. Um, but again, look at what your most requested things are, especially, you know, professors always want just a nice picture of campus to put in their slide when they go do a professional presentation. A couple of your just most representative, the marketing type images, that's gonna be the best place to start. Make sure, of course, you have some student images. Um, but you could start a stock gallery with as little as 20 images. So I'd start there and then get feedback from your clients. Go around to meetings and ask people, hey, I'm looking, I'm looking at adding stock, what do you need? Uh, and that's something you could even do on your uh, Instagram page or your Twitter account. And you'll get lots of response. And uh, people are very happy because we're constantly coming back to them and saying, what else can we do? How else can we uh, make it better for you? And we try to listen to those concerns. So a question that came earlier that I responded to about converting our raw files to DNGs, I said no, and they're asking, can you explain why that we do not convert our like CR2 files to DNGs? Uh, that's a decision I made years ago. Um, I, I think it's an extra and unnecessary step, but that's just my opinion. I, I don't think that uh, Adobe is gonna go out of business, and even if they do, there's converters that we can convert them to DNG or another format. My biggest problem with DNG is, is there's one company that uses it, Adobe. Right. Uh, I'm sorry. And the camera companies, like say, even if they go out of business, there's going to be there's going to be ways to transfer those CR2, CR3 files to a DNG or another more universal format. And that's just a personal preference. You don't have to listen to me on that. That's just how we do it. I feel like I, I'm just trying to save that extra step uh, from trying to convert over to DNG. Another question. Does the metadata embed in the CR2 and NEF or is there or in the XMP file? Uh, it, it should embed in the raw file, but we'd have, there are some times where it will, it will do as an XMP file. It's an issue we've noticed with the Sony, Nate. I don't know if you want to explain that. Well, there, there was an issue where um, if I deleted the XMP file, then it did delete all of the metadata from the, the Sony raw file. But then I found out that was just something that I could switch in Photo Mechanic. Um, so it didn't write to a sidecar file. The one thing that does save that I feel is uh, relatively important with the XMP is when you make edits to your raw file, those will be saved in your sidecar file, your XMP. Yeah. So yeah. if you don't want to have to re-edit your photos again, and they don't take up hardly any space, but those are also in the sidecar file. Yeah, photo mechanics should be saving it to the actual raw file. It shouldn't have to add a sidecar unless you're doing an edit to the photo. So good questions. We ready to move forward? right now for this. Okay, the best part, you guys excited? Time to wake up. Archiving. All right, nobody wants to talk about it, but basically to be archived means that your files are gonna outlast you. And again, that may sound grim, but that's the whole point, right? You want people to remember you through your photos. Um, I hear this all the time. I'm fine, I've got everything on the server, we're good. Well, no, you're not. Let me just tell you from personal experience, every single method of storing digital photos is only temporary. Every method will fail at some point. Over the years, I've had nine or 10 hard drives completely just die on me. I had an entire RAID array completely go bad on me and I couldn't fix it, the company couldn't fix it, nobody could fix it. Uh, every, the problem with, the, with every method of storage that we have is, is they are hardware dependent. And you might think, well, but I have it on the cloud and they have multiple backups. It's still hardware dependent. So you need to make sure that you, you look for the long view. Is that hard drive gonna be around in 100 years? No. Is that cloud site gonna be there in 100 years? Probably not. So we need to really think about what is it I need to do to make sure that this data lasts for the long term. So you need basically a backup strategy. You need a, you need a plan to go ahead and, and make this happen. I think a real important thing to remember is, is that you have two different ways of storing your data, offline and online. Offline, of course, is external hard drives, tape backup, Blu-ray discs. It's not connected to the internet. Now, online would be connected and, and usable, things like RAID arrays, servers, cloud storage. I strongly believe that for long-term storage, offline is best. 
Online is great for the near line storage, for things you need to you know, manage in your daily day-to-day -day archive. But for long-term storage, offline is best. Because first of all, whenever you have a drive spinning or your tape on, it's, it's got a, a specific life to it. Because again, you're using mechanical parts. And if you have, you know, your hard drive's plugged in and it's constantly running 24 seven for years, it's going to die at some point. The great thing about an offline, having an external hard drive, you can download the data to it, data to it take it offline and it's gonna last a lot longer because it's not being used, it's just sitting on a shelf. Uh, so I, I would definitely recommend that you, for your long-term storage, you need to look offline. For your short-term storage, you need to look online. A mantra that you just have to remember, the key to survival of data, multiple copies, multiple locations. I mean, you've, had, we, you've all had it happen to you. Somebody came to you and say, hey, you know, you're a photographer, you deal with hard drives a lot. My hard drive's like clicking and it's making this weird noise and I can't get my photos off, can you fix it? And you, you automatically say like, do you have those backed up somewhere? And they're like, no. And you just have to give them the bad news, right? Your data needs to be in multiple copies in multiple locations. Uh, again, that means that I have a copy here in my office and I have a copy somewhere else so that if my office, you know, goes down in the next earthquake, hopefully I'll be backed up elsewhere. Um, the way we, we, dis we explain that, the way we describe that in digital asset management is we have an access copy and an archive copy. The access copy is again, the one that is in the office, the one that you're going to use when you need to get to it. The archive copy is sent somewhere else off site, and it's only accessed in an emergency. And again, you're trying to maintain that you have a copy for sure, always have at least one copy somewhere else. So let's jump into offline. First of all, USB drives. Um, my pet peeve of digital asset management is USB drives because these things fail quicker than anything else. And the reason is, is because first of all, they're being moved constantly. And secondly, what's happening is, is you're taking an actual external hard drive and then you're adding a connector to it and a board and these, I've had, I've had so many external hard drives die over the years. Those don't count as my 10. Uh, and what I've found is, is usually what happens is the connector to your hard drive or the board will, will quit before the hard drive will. So you may have some hard drives you think have gone bad, pop them open, take the hard drive out, and you'd be surprised how many of them are actually working just fine. It was just the connecting pin that went bad or the PC board that went bad. I don't believe that external hard drives like this are useful for long-term storage. What we do is we use bare drives. So just a, a hard drive like you would put in a server rack. Um, the reason is, is again, you lose all that extra connections. And also when I'm archiving this, I don't have to archive multiple plugs like USB 2s, USB 3, USB C, or power supplies. I have something else that I'm gonna connect to those with. Those are called drive docks. Uh, they look like a toaster for your hard drive. And the great thing is, is actually this is a two bay drive dock, USB-C connection to the computer. Uh, you can quickly make a copy from one drive to another by putting two drives in there. It's great. This is a far superior way of accessing uh, multiple hard drives. It takes a lot less space and it's far more reliable. Now hard drives are finicky. Uh, there's one thing they do not like and it's called static. And we create static all the time. To make sure that you're protecting your hard drives, especially for the long term, you need to have them stored in some type of an anti-static case. I love, for example, this Pro Storage Foam is a good example of something I love. It's completely made out of anti-static foam and the piece on the bottom is actually the lid, so you can put a lid on it. They make them so that they actually fit inside your drawer. This is Nate's drawer. Um, and we just keep them in there. I, I took the covers off so you could see the hard drives. It makes it really easy to store and to access those, those drives. And again, they're protected. Uh, here's just what it looks like from the top. Wet for um, our archive copy, I actually keep them in my house. Actually, I keep them under my shoes in my closet so they're nice and safe. Uh, my favorite thing to, to store those drives in is something called a turtle case, which is basically just a pelican with anti-static foam inside. It's, meant, it's made for hard drives. Now, I just recently saw that this company, uh, Pro Storage, also makes inserts for existing pelican cases. Cases, I'm sorry. A lot of us have Pelicans sitting around that we aren't using anymore. You could actually go ahead and buy a, a, an insert and just start using that Pelican case for, for this type of purpose. But again, uh, this, this makes it easy for me to transport it back if I need to check any data. And it, again, anti-static, waterproof, crush proof. Uh, it does a great job of, ma of managing those drives for the long term. Going into online storage. So let me get a drink real quick. 
Uh, most of us are familiar with RAIDs, redundant array of independent drives. Basically what a RAID is, is it takes multiple drives and stores your data across multiple drives in a way that they're backed up. If one drive dies, the entire array is, is okay. It's basically spreading that data out in multiple copies. Um, RAIDs are great and for, for us, we should be using RAID arrays for our, especially for our primary storage activities. Uh, here's the example. This is what we use. It's called a Synology RS3412 RPXS rack mount uh, RAID. It's got two expenses chassis. We, we have about 110 terabytes of storage in RAID level six. Here's what it looks like in our server room. Um, and it's, I'm telling you, I've been really happy with Synology. They're pretty, they're pretty uh, reasonable on the price and they've been really, really reliable. Uh, one other thing that the Synology allows us to do is an automated backup. So we use this Synology box as our primary storage. You know, we, we have something we call Big General and Big Sports. Uh, all of our generals go into one side of the array. All of our sports photos go into the other side of the array. That's where we copy things to. That's where we check. That's how user our day-to-day -day access is going off of this RAID array. Now, the great thing is, is the software allows us to do a backup automated. That means every single night at 1 a.m., it's actually taking anything that's been changed during the day and it's copying to uh, box.com, which is a cloud site. And that's awesome because I never have to worry about it. And I automatically have a backup without having it. And I come in the next morning, it's done, and it, and it works really well. Uh, most, most arrays will give you some type of a backup, automated backup system. But I really, I really love cloud sites for automated backup because, again, it takes, it, cloud sites are bad because it takes time to copy things over. But in the middle of the night, it doesn't, it's not bad at all. And I don't have to worry about it. So here's what our box.com backup looks like. And again, you can kind of just see here's 2019 and photos are separated in different folders, the raw photos. Uh, and that's where our backup, our, our day-to-day -day backup resides. So when you bring everything together, this is what our, our backup strategy looks like. First of all, our primary drive to that local rate server, that's the first place things are saved. And then it's again, backed up nightly to box.com. That's our first backup. Those first two things are our online storage. For our offline storage, we have the offline access copy, which is a single hard drive. Basically what Nate does is he, at the end of the year, in a few months after the shoot's uh, a month's done, he goes and he saves that copy of everything nice and cleaned up and he saves two hard drive copies. One stays in the office, which is the offline access copy. And one goes to my house, which is the offline archive copy. Uh, so when we have our finished data and it's clean, we have two hard drives at all times. So uh, I do want to say one thing about those hard drive copies. It's a really good idea that you check those hard drives every year. Now, hard drives do a good job of keeping things and backing them up for a long term, for the long term, but it's a good idea to mount it every year, just check your files, make sure that everything's still working. And then that way, if you have a hard drive that's going bad, you can very quickly make a copy off of the other, uh, off of the other copy. So again, it's, it's just something that's a project you should do maybe whenever it's slow for you. For us, it's every summer. Uh, and it's something that's very easy for a student to do. Finally, uh, I talked about at the beginning that no matter what, all of these methods of storage are going to fail. So the way that you, you overcome that is you have a migration strategy. What that means is when there is a new solution that comes out, you need to be willing to take your data and move it to the new solution. When I started backing up photos back in 2001, we used CDs. That was the best thing we had. It was the cheapest. And we would copy all of our photos to CDs and we had a big giant drawers of CDs. Then DVDs came out and actually they you could fit six or seven times uh, the data on one, on one DVD. So we copied our stuff to that. And then Blu-rays came out, we started copying the Blu-rays. And now we've kind of transitioned over to hard drives and cloud storage, just kind of a mixture of the two. We're currently, we're looking at tape to see if that's gonna be a good long-term solution. We're always having an eye towards the future to say what's gonna last the longest time. As long as you're migrating your data constantly to the newest technology, you won't lose anything as long as you're diligent about it and you have, and again, you have a strategy for it. Okay. I have some questions. Let's go. All right, Jaron, the first one, just a quick cost estimate for these different archiving methods. Uh, I mean, it totally depends on how much data you're talking about. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, drives are cheaper per terabyte than they, than they have been in a long time. Uh, really good. I'd say that that's probably the best 
long-term solution, again, is just individual bare hard drives. Uh, for your primary storage, though, you need to have a server. You need to have it so it's accessible to you and your clients and your coworkers. Um, I, I, I just think it's really important to have both. Uh, the rack mounts, it, it, they, the nice thing is that Synology has, you know, 40 different options of different things, all the way from a, a RAID with two drives up to, you know, hundreds of drives. So it kind of, you know, scale to what you can afford. Uh, but, you know, a 12 terabyte drive costs, what, a couple hundred bucks now, uh, 250. And you can get a lot of data on a 12 terabyte drive. I think right now we're, we're uh, capturing about uh, 1 million photos a year in our office. And that fits, mostly of that fits on two 12 terabyte drives when we've saved it, isn't that right, Nate? Um, I think we've been able to fit it on, well, yeah, with sports and our general combined, yeah, but you, we could fit our general on a 12 terabyte and have space, and then our sports, I think we could probably fit on a 12, all of it maybe. So all of 2019 will fit on two access drives and two archive drives, that's four hard drives. And that's, that's totally reasonable. But that brings up a good point. Uh, storage should be a part of your line item budget. It be, should be something your boss gives you money for every year because you have to protect those photos. When the president needs something, he doesn't care if you have a budget for it. He wants the photo. Your job is to protect those photos. And, and you're going to have to do a good job of making sure that your boss and your coworkers understand that storage just, it's a cost of doing business. You have to do it. And they need to make sure you need to, you may need to make a good argument for uh, these type of expenses because you just can't get around them. If you're going to store that data, if you're going to save that data for the long term, you need to be able to do it the right way. So, Jaron, for smaller schools with little budgets, what would you say is the bare minimum we should be doing? Multiple copies, multiple locations. So, if I know a lot of people that they just work off of a USB drive connected to their computer. It needs to be backed up somewhere else. Uh, you, even something as simple as Blackblaze, which is just an online, uh, again, an online storage, you can, it does like a nightly backup. Uh, or you need to make you know, copies every month and then take that hard drive home. That's the bare minimum, but it's not enough. You, you, need, to, you need to make sure and fight for, fight for uh, your office to make sure that you're doing this the right way. Is a good question. Were there any surprises in the past five years that that you wish you knew about at the time with implementing our your strategy? Um, I, I don't know if about the past five years. Um, I think about five years ago is when we switched from external hard drives to uh, bare drives, maybe it's six or so. But that's been, that's been one change. I think the surprise is, is how quickly the hard drives have gotten so big. You know, the fact that we're doing 12 and 14 terabyte hard drives is awesome, right? The technology's moved fairly, fairly quickly. And like I say, the, the price per terabyte is so low compared to almost any other way of storing. Um, it's, it's really hard though. I spent a lot, I actually am friends with the archivist at the library and I have to ask him from time to time, hey, what's coming? Do I need to be prepared to change this or am I doing the best right now? You should probably make friends with a librarian, uh, one that's the data archiving specialist in, and that's another thing that our group can help one another do. Um, we can help come up with some of these solutions. I know that there's different scales, like say a small university or a small college is gonna have far less resources, but you're not alone. Look at all the people out here that, that are going through the same exact thing. Let's talk about it. Ask on the Facebook group, you know, get advice. Uh, the, one of the great things about the UPA is, is that we're here to help each other. So tap into that help and definitely have an eye on the future. I will always, you know, you're always welcome to ask me. I'll try and tell you what I know, but I'm always looking for this because this is a big part of what we do. Um, I would say that coming up, uh, I'd like to say tape is becoming really interesting again. There's some really big tape drives that are, you can store for pretty cheaply. The problem right now is, is first of all, there's not enough supply of the tapes. And two, it's the, the readers and the writers are super expensive, like $5,000 or, or more. So I'm kind of, I'm sitting on the fence with the tape thing. Um, and I'm just kind of, I'm just gonna do in the hard drive thing for right now, like say multiple copies with our online backups and our offline backups, I feel pretty comfortable with where we're right now. That will change. So a question about um, if, if somebody doesn't have their own archive, but they go through their IT, what are uh, suggestions there? Oh, good, really good question. Uh, something we've had to deal with a little bit in the past. Uh, you need to you need to go to lunch with them and you need to talk to them and you need to explain what your needs are 
And the question you need to ask them is very important. What's their backup strategy? If your photos are on their server, what happens if that server goes down? Because this happened at BYU a few years ago. Uh, a lot of researchers had their research on a computer, uh, I'm sorry, on a big server for the university and it went down. And yes, they did have a backup, but it took some researchers six months to get their data back. So you need to make sure that you know their system and that they, they need to know your requirements. Uh, and honestly, if you're ser saving all your stuff on a university server, I wouldn't put it, I wouldn't trust just them. I would still have my own backup on hard drives that I maintain. Because again, they, to them, it's just numbers. It's just X's and O's. To, to us, it's our livelihood. It's what we do, it's the history of the university. So if you are being forced to use that type of a system, I always still make your own backup. Um, SSD or your hard drive? Uh, currently, I would still recommend hard drive. They have a longer shelf life than SSD and SSD just are unproven. SSD have a promising future, but we just don't know yet. Right now, they're a lot more expensive too uh, per terabyte. Uh, you can, like I say, you can get 12 terabyte, 14 terabyte drives for a couple hundred bucks now. I would start with that. Um, even more promising than SSD is a thing called a holographic disk, which uh, they can save the data in a new way. Um, that's developing, that's coming. It's just not ready for prime time yet. That's not to be confused with laser disk, right? No, 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 not optical. Um, do you have any recommendations on hard drive brands or models? Yeah, this is a sore point. Uh, Hitachi were my favorite drives by far. Uh, and then Western Digital went and gobbled them up. So Hitachi drives are, in fact, let me go back to it. Uh, Hitachi drives uh, like this um, have had the best reliability of all drives I've ever used. And uh, now, now, now um, Western Digital bought the brand and they bought the factory. So they're actually making Western Digital drives in that factory. And I think they're called something ultra star or something like that. Um, so they're really still a really high quality, but uh, I, I can make some recommendations online if you want, or you can send me an email and I'll send you some recommendations. I, I haven't been a big fan of Seagate. Um, I've had some failures with them. I, right now I'd say, I mean, Western Digital is the, is the most dominant force in hard drives right now and they're probably making the best drives. It's just important that you try and identify the ones that are made in the old Hitachi factory because those, those are awesome. Um, there was a question on here that I answered a really simple answer, but there was, uh, do we keep all of the raws or just the select? So I don't know if yeah. you want to talk about why we do that. What and do I don't know why I skipped over the call. Um, basically when, when we say call, it means when you go through your initial edit of the photos, I mean your initial run through of the photos, we'll tag the photos, all the photos and then untag the keepers or do it the other way around. I'd say on our general shoots, we're saving about 75% of the photos, but on our sports, we're saving maybe 40 to 45%. Um, so we do not archive, we do not save those, those throwaways. Those are the photos that you know, are, are duplicates or they're, they're not technically very good or they're out of focus or whatever. Uh, we, don't, we don't save all of those raw files. Uh, we just save the ones that we're gonna keep in our archive. Uh, so far, I think that's all the questions. Okay. Um, now, I know that there's a lot of information. I apologize for putting you to sleep. I I'm going to actually wrote a blog post that I'm going to be posting the next day or two on our exposure site. Here it is. It's going to be called Damn Basics. And we actually have a video, of, so it's a little bit shorter version of kind of what we've talked about here today. Again, my, my goal is, is that we have kind of a white paper standard that we start with, you know, People that join the UPA may be coming from newspapers or from other fields and they, they may not have had to deal with digital asset management. So this will hopefully be a resource that you can use, not only uh, to help people that are new, but maybe help your bosses understand the importance of this. Feel free to share it with them. Uh, if, if you're fighting for budget, you, know, you, you need to show why it's important that you have a budget. And again, if you'd like to follow us more, we'll have more coming up on, on like I said, our YouTube page and our other channels and whatnot uh, that we have coming in the future. So, okay. So that's, that's it. Any other questions we have? I don't know if you want to, uh, Jaron, going back to Ken's question, do you want to just screen share and show everybody kind of how we have the server set up and organized? 
Uh, yeah, let me see if I'm connected. And there was another question too, while Jaren's uh, getting that ready about do we work off of the server? Primarily we do not. Um, our connection isn't as uh, fast as we would like it right now. We're working on that. Um, so for the most part, we don't work off of our server. Me and Jaren have uh, dual rated drives uh, that we that are connected, to, that we use as our primary hard drive on our computers. But then we will copy that over to the server uh, either before we're finished working on it or right as we're ingesting it or after we're ingesting it. Um, but yeah, typically we don't work off of our server. Yeah, and that's, and that's a good question. I think that uh, it's important to note that those are, those are dual drives so that if one drive bot dies, the other one has to copy. So as soon as we download that card, it's already backed up to a second drive. We do all of our initial work on that and then the finished product gets copied over to the server. All of our students work in the same way. They have hard drives that they use and then copy to the server. It, you know, as you know, working over the network, it's never as fast as you'd like it to be. Um, but that's just, that's how it works best for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and share this real quick. Okay. All right, so here's, um, You guys see that there? This is a, basically what our server would look like. Um, right now on our online server, we have 2019 and 2020. If you come into a specific month, for example, March, here's all of our shoots. This is, a, this is an error we got to fix, actually, that the server just created. Um, but it's quite, quite simple. So all of our shoots for March are right here. For some reason, I don't know why we haven't been working very hard this month, Nate. Look how empty this month is. It's crazy. Uh, a lot of COVID shoots too. Uh, but you know, here's February. So that, our, like I say, it's just a simple ascending order of shoots. So we had 61 shoots in February. Now for sports, it's a little bit different. Oh, there it is. So sports, um, we actually organize things by the sport. And then when you go into the sport, then you have each of the seasons. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but for like a sport that bridges uh, both two years, so 18 to 19, we, we change the file name so that it reflects that too. Um, so 18 to 19 men's basketball at Utah, right? Um, but basically all of the photo shoots for the year in here, and it's, it's, it's nothing fancy. Uh, is there anything specific that you wanted to see as far as the way that we have this organized? I, I would like to see maybe your client view of, um, of your archive. Oh. oh, absolutely. Okay, let's bring it in. Oh, is your archive publicly viewable? Do, I have to, do, do, do you have to be logged in to see the stock so, and all that? So it's uh, it's it's some of it's viewable, and I'm gonna that's where I'm gonna show this library side. Um, it depends on the client. Some clients have full access. So when you, they come to their web page, everybody's gonna see kind of basically this, you know, and this is where the stocks are and everything like that. And then we have hidden from the view is, is the archive, and in the archive, they'll come in. and It's just the same organization. So here's a devotional. Um, these are the edits. And again, this is only what we're sharing. These are the edits. Now, depending on, on who it is, you know, all the graphic designers that we work with, our magazine people, our, our communications people, they have access to all this type of stuff. The same with the people that work in sports, they have access to it too. But the general public can't just go in and look at every photo. That's, uh, that's, that's something that's reserved. Here's the athletic side. You know, uh, there's the basketball seasons. Now, if I were to just show, the portal view, you know, basically people, when they, when they log in, they'll be able to go and look at the galleries. And then like say, everybody will have access to these things. 
except for athletics because I'm not gonna have athletics, but stock photos. When they come into stock photos, they're, they're different things. We just added the Zoom backgrounds. For some reason, everybody wants Zoom backgrounds the last couple of days. Um, but it, they can come in and they can say, oh, I need to find some campus photos. Everything's organized by building in here, a descending list. Uh, and again, CTB is the short name, the full name. And then of course people can come in and try do a search and find things in that way. Uh, we list every, the, the newer photos first. Um, and like I said, this is something we're still trying to make even better. But for, for the most part, people are pretty happy with it. And just to clarify, so people do see the athletics photos on our website, but they, do, they cannot download them. Oh, they, can, yeah. they can purchase them or they can pay to download them, but they don't have free access to them. Yeah, only a few select people have access to everything. Any other questions? Yeah, so another question, are there any other departments on your campus to operate their own visual archive? Uh, they said our campus athletics, music, theater departments have their own operation for visuals outside of their database. How do we manage our archives not in our department? Uh, well, I don't know that you can. That's hard. Um, it uh, totally depends on how your campus is set up, what your structure is. Um, one thing you can do is offer to bring everything together into one place. Um, and I've seen other campuses do that, like say, hey, we're going to get this Libris account and we'd love to start managing this, you know, I, I just personally, if you if you can't control their their system, if, they, if they're not going to follow the correct way of naming, keywording, editing and stuff, I wouldn't want to control all their stuff. I, I, uh, I try to make sure that we just have the best resource out there that, so that nobody else would even want to think about using anybody else's. Uh, question from Matt, if we can, if you can show photo mechanic keywords look like if you're a student entering the metadata. Yeah. Oh, I already have mechanic open. Here's my slides. So here's the template and this is the last photo shoot that we did. Um, so again, it's showing up. But generally what we like to do is, first of all, we have the file name base. I always like to have that so that the file name is always in the caption. Because you guys know graphic designers, they're automatically going to change the file name to second page, right corner, something stupid, right? And then they're going to come back to me a week later and say, hey, I need photos, second page, to right corner. In the caption, everything should still be there, the, the original file name of the file. Uh, this next part will be the shoot, the shoot name and the, and the slug for the shoot. And then just the, my, my normal caption. And then we're, again, we're using photo mechanics uh, variables to automatically put the name, the date, the photographer. The keywords are right here. And they'll come in and use structured keywords. And let's say that, you know, we want to say it's in the crab tree. So they, it'll come up and they just double click on crab tree and it can add that to the caption set. But again, well, Ken will be going into that quite a bit more and how to set that up, how to manage that. Any other questions? Yeah, Chris just asked if there's a reason that uh, you didn't hide unused areas of the IPTC stationery. I, I probably should, huh? Uh, I, I should. Um, I, I, I always am, you know, wondering like how much, how many of those fields should I enter? How much should I share? Uh, it's, it's a work in progress, but that's a good, good suggestion. I think that's all the questions so far. Okay, well, last chance. You should go eat. Well, guys, uh, thanks for joining us today. I, I, I'm glad that we were able to share this and hopefully it was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to, to reach out to us. But like I said, we're going to have this uh, document shared. We're going to have a blog post. We're going to have a video. But while we're kind of all confined to home for a while, let's take advantage of the time and let's jump in and let's, let's make the best systems possible. Let's make sure that these photos outlast us. But uh, 
great to see you guys and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.